what put me over the edge was to hear it's not ADHD. You're screwed up because of that TBI you had five years ago. Stop thinking of yourself as someone with major depression disorder and ADHD and start to think of yourself as a person who is forever disadvantaged and needs to be in a group for brain damaged folks like yourself. Medical professionals like that are clearly unqualified and miserable and don't belong in a helping field. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast. ADHD for smart-ass women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 178 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I hope that you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyoutsuka.com. You know, my purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. In the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant thing. Not one. And of course, that includes you. So before we start today's podcast, I'd like to share a few podcast reviews because it's just me here today. Um, And I really, before I start, I want to acknowledge you for taking the time to write your reviews. I know that none of us ever have enough time, right? So I really appreciate you taking the time immensely. You know, your reviews, they really do help to spread the word so that we can reach even more women with ADHD. So Bella Torn says, uh, titles her review, Amazed. This podcast is truly amazing. I always feel motivated, inspired, and optimistic after listening. I have ADHD, and I really admire your work, Tracy. I'm looking forward to every Wednesday. Thank you a million times. Grateful greetings from Norway. Thank you, Bella. As always, you know that I love hearing when my work is making a difference in someone's life. So thank you so much for sharing that. Outdoor Gal 14 titles her review simply fabulous. Tracy, you have helped me better understand myself and others in an even deeper and more meaningful way than I ever have before. I love both the scientific evidence and emotional balance you provide. Again, Outdoor Gal 14, thank you again for your kind words and just allowing me to do what it is that I do, you know, for being a listener. Because if I didn't have you all listeners, of course, I probably wouldn't be doing this. Then again, maybe I would because I really love doing it. And that leads me to our last review from Shelly. I think it's pronounced Shelly. It's spelled C-H-E-L-L-E-1237899. And her review is titled Love Topics, Hate the Reviews. (laughs) Shelly. Anyway, this is what Shelly says. I love the information that you present in the podcast. I haven't found a more helpful ADHD podcast yet. 
I appreciate that, Shelley. However, reading people's reviews at the beginning of the episode is so distracting. I have to skip forward. Could you stop doing this or at least do it at the end? Shelley, respectfully, no. I mean, you must know me better than this, right? I'm ADHD. So if someone asks me not to do something, you can be damn well sure that I am going to do it. And this is the deal. I provide all of this gratis. There's no charge. It's free. Yet, I spend hours every week on the research, hours finding guests, writing show notes, sending out newsletters, introducing the podcast, and then I spend more time every week answering all of your questions. And you know what? A lot of this costs money because I don't edit my own podcast. I'm not even sure I'd know how to do that. I have to hire a podcast editor and a podcast producer. My assistant needs to make sure that everything goes out in time, so she creates the graphics, and it just goes on and on, right? But you know what gives me tons of positive emotion? Yeah, it's the gold stars from our listeners. So because it lights up my internal rudder, my inner guidance system, I don't really care what anyone says, right? It feels good to me. It generates positive emotion for me. And so I'm going to do it. But you know what, Shelly? I still love you because I'm doing what I want to do. And wouldn't I be a fraud if I constantly talked about how important it is for our ADHD brains to follow our own rudder, our own inner guidance system, and figure out where our positive emotion lives? but I didn't follow any of my own advice. So there's your answer. But Shelly, thank you so much for your kind words. And thank you also for allowing me to use your review as another opportunity to focus on what matters to me. I truly appreciate you. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, The title of our podcast episode, episode number 178, is No, It's Not ADHD and Other Bullshit Women Hear from Medical Professionals Who Frankly Should Know Better. So you only have to talk to a handful of ADHD women to know that our ADHD traits vary wildly in how they show up. On top of this, there's also such narrow diagnostic criteria for ADHD, so it's no wonder so many of us are missed. Now, individually, what we're going to talk about today has all been mentioned in various podcast episodes that I've recorded, but I know that we pick up information when we're ready to hear it, and because I've heard a lot about this idea that "Mm, ADHD is overdiagnosed, there's not as much ADHD as we think there is, I just felt called to bring it up again, right? I thought it would be a good opportunity to dive in once more. So what I did for this podcast is I asked our Facebook members, our smart-ass Facebook members, to share stories about the crazy stuff that their doctors and mental health professionals told them about why it can't possibly be ADHD. And this is what I got. Okay. In the no idea what ADHD even looks like category, I offer Jackie N. Jackie N says that she was told, you can't have ADHD because you can focus on things you enjoy. What the hell? That medical professional, she said, hadn't even heard of interest and how when an ADHD brain is interested, we can hyperfocus. They must have thought that an ADHD brain couldn't focus on anything. Susan Yu went to interview a prospective therapist, and the therapist told her, you don't look like you have ADHD. Susan said, well, I thought, what the hell does that even mean? And from a therapist, I was too put off by the remark to challenge it. I viewed it as shorthand that she was the wrong person for me, and I went back to searching for someone better. What was crazy was she appeared to be a very accomplished therapist from her polished, well-organized website. She had a regular radio show she hosted and the high rate she charged, so that was confusing for me. I've since learned to trust my gut when I hear things like this. People tell you exactly who they are. 
It's our job to listen and believe them the first time. I think that's a takeoff from Maya Angelou's wonderful quote, when people show you who they are the first time, believe them. Clearly, this therapist had no idea how ADHD presents in women. Emily T. offered that she was already diagnosed when she went to a therapist. I told him some examples of how I'm forgetful, and he said, these are normal things everyone does sometimes, and I've done similar things like this myself. My examples were flooding the laundry room because I forgot the sink was running and causing water damage, getting many parking tickets and then just forgetting to pay them, getting my car towed, not paying bills unless collections calls me, not filling up my gas tank, and then my car won't start, just to name a few. Good to know I'm normal. Emily, you know what? This reminds me, I was working with a fantastic hypnotherapist recently because I wanted to see if it could help me with my ADHD symptoms. I was hoping to come back, you know, with a podcast episode to offer my ADHD women an alternative therapy that is backed by science and research, which hypnotherapy is. But I have to tell you, the most frustrating thing was that as good as this hypnotherapist was... I felt like the entire time she was trying to convince me that I didn't have ADHD, but rather that it was my thoughts that created the ADHD. Yeah, no. Then we have Katie, who offers this. She was told, it's not ADHD. I can tell by the way you talk to your daughter. Apparently, she had her one-year-old daughter in the appointment. Katie was then told, it's not ADHD. You just need someone to help you organize your life. So one in five mental health patients likely has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, hate that term, but sadly, most doctors and mental health professionals receive little, if any, training in ADHD and how to recognize its symptoms in girls, adult women, older patients, and alongside comorbid conditions. ADHD symptoms often resemble and overlap with those symptoms of other conditions like depression and anxiety, and they lead to misdiagnoses, but also incomplete diagnosis when unrecognized comorbidities actually do exist, which we know is common in ADHD. So how was the diagnostic criteria established? Well, until recently, almost exclusively, ADHD studies have been on hyperactive prepubescent white boys which has led to this narrow diagnostic criteria that, as I just mentioned, excludes the experiences of girls, women, BIPOC women, and even boys with inattentive type ADHD. The DSM criteria for ADHD, it's for children, children aged 6 through 12. So there's no DSM criteria for diagnosing adults. In my podcast, what I do is usually refer to Russell Barclay's adult ADHD scales for diagnosing ADHD. Now, the diagnostic criteria created in the DSM is based simply on what can be observed externally and essentially how disruptive you are to those around you. It doesn't include anything that's going on internally like emotional dysregulation, despite the fact that many, if not most, ADHDers report that that is probably one of their biggest challenges. It also leaves out rejection-sensitive dysphoria, even though most adolescents and adults with ADHD acknowledge experiencing RSD to some degree. Another one of our group members, Michelle, told us that She was told that you don't have ADHD, you're tired all the time. And before that, you don't have a sleep disorder, you're just an overworked mom. You know, Michelle's final comment was, medical gaslighting makes it so hard to get real effective treatment. And in fact, sleep is another thing that the DSM criteria for ADHD ignores. Yet, Sleep disorders are a huge problem for those of us with ADHD. It's estimated that 75% of children and adults with ADHD have a sleep problem, whether it's that they can't get themselves into bed. I'm guilty of that one. They can't fall asleep. They can't stay asleep or they can't get themselves up. Yet, they can't get themselves up in the morning. 
Yet, sleep challenges are not recognized as a symptom of ADHD. Relationship disappointment is reported as another one of the biggest ADHD symptoms for adults, but it too is not currently recognized as a symptom of ADHD, not by the DSM at least. Dr. Dara or Dara Abraham is a psychiatrist who offers that, you know, it's harder to be mindful and emotionally attuned to others when distractibility is a problem. ADHD may affect your ability to communicate and naturally connect with a wide range of people. Your relationships, they may suffer, and you may ultimately feel disconnected from your partner, your family, and your friends. You may easily lose touch with others because of ADHD symptoms like forgetfulness and disorganization. Unfortunately, it can cause others to label you as self-centered and selfish when that couldn't be farthest from the truth. Regardless, none of these are recognized as symptoms or traits of ADHD. And then we have the problem with misconceptions about what even ADHD is, right? ADHD is associated with a narrow list of stereotypical behaviors. So if you experience less obvious ADHD symptoms, especially if you're raised as a girl or have inattentive type ADHD, it often goes undiagnosed. So of course, our next category is, it's not ADHD because you're not hyperactive. So Kate offered this. This was from her medical professional. It's not ADHD because you're quiet. Those of my friends with ADHD were outgoing and talkative, like they never stopped talking. Meanwhile, I lived in my head and I couldn't even focus on any conversation enough to know what people were talking about. I couldn't say anything besides, what are you talking about? Wait, go back to the start. (laughs) I resemble that remark, Kate, which made people so annoyed. So I stayed quiet. I always overthought everything I would say and if people would judge me. I wrote down in my notes things to say before hanging out with friends so I would remember what to talk about. I'm also an introvert, so I'm not going from social event to social event, joking around 24-7 or sharing every bit of my personal interests to people. I guess that's how they perceive ADHD. Rachel offered, I don't think you have ADHD because you're not fidgeting right now. That's what her medical professional offered. As Rachel says, I was in the office in front of the doctor. The first time I'd ever gotten up the courage to speak to any doctor about it. And after that comment, I didn't speak to anyone again about it for almost a decade. Most people expect ADHD to create visible hyperactivity only, when in fact, this only occurs in 25% of children and 5% of adults. The rest experience an internal feeling of hyperarousal. ADHD, remember, it's a misnomer. We know it's not a deficit of attention, but those around us do not. So if we're able to do well or focus in some areas because they're of interest to us and we have interest-driven nervous systems, people around us assume we should be able to apply that same focus to all areas. And if we don't, it's a choice we're making, which we know it's not. Our attention fluctuates based on level of interest. Because our attention is inconsistent, it often seen as something we have control over. Hyperfocus can be our saving grace, but it can also prevent us from getting a diagnosis because we can hide our struggles and people assume we should be able to apply that level of intense work to all scenarios. And when we don't, it, we're seen as lazy, selfish, and flawed. There are also many societal pressures put on people raised as girls to mask and internalize symptoms, which makes us less disruptive to others and therefore less likely to be identified, especially with inattentive ADHD. Even external signs of hyperactivity in girls like talkativeness is not recognized as an ADHD symptoms. It is seen as something within our control. 
Girls are often socialized to be less disruptive in school, and they internalize hyperactivity. Or it comes out as chattiness, right, which is seen as a bad habit rather than an ADHD trait. Chattiness can also be seen as charming and social. So it's not even seen as a symptom of anything. It's just, again, it's how we are. Many with undiagnosed ADHD, we overcompensate for symptoms. We develop maladaptive coping strategies. So we may be always overprepared or develop these near compulsive checking behaviors, which can get to the level where it almost mimics OCD in some ways. We can also end up with anxiety because we are so hyper alert. When we believe that our symptoms are within our control, this is what leads to shame and a reduced willingness to ask for help when we need it. This buildup of shame can be a reason why many ADHD women go undiagnosed. When we're socialized to believe that women naturally are born with these amazing executive function skills, we think it's us, right? There must be something wrong with us when we struggle to plan, schedule, and organize. Because look at all these other women. They can do it. So let's move on to the too smart, too organized category. And in that category, I give you Amanda S., who was told, you're too organized and too intelligent. She had a planner she had created for herself, for herself that was color-coded for each person and each activity. She was hyper-organized. Sorsha was told, you have degrees, you probably have autism, it's not ADHD. This was after explaining, according to Sorsha, that I changed degrees multiple times. It took me 12 years to complete the first one. I withdrew from more units than I passed. Every assessment was done the night before it was due, and I regularly burned out. So the deal, Sorsha, is if you're smart, I guess it can't be ADHD, it has to be autism. Of course, sometimes it can actually be both, right? Alicia was told this. Most people with ADHD don't graduate high school. You have a bachelor's degree. You absolutely do not have ADHD. You need to just stop being lazy and put a little effort into your life. Katie was told, if you're getting your PhD, it's not ADHD. There's a belief held by many medical professionals, teachers, etc., that if you're doing well in school or at work, that you couldn't possibly have ADHD. Of course, this ignores masking and coping strategies and implies that neurodivergent people are incapable of being successful. There's this belief that if you have ADHD, it means you have low intelligence. People with ADHD vary in their intelligence, whatever that elusive word even means, right? So they vary in their intelligence as much as the general population does. Many people with ADHD are extremely intelligent, especially in the areas of creativity, problem solving, originality, intuition, tenacity, and many also have high emotional IQ. Now, when we say many, in truth, I believe it's all people. You know, you've heard me say so many times that I've never met an ADHD person that wasn't truly brilliant at something. So I believe that we are all not just smart, but brilliant in our area of interest. So what's our next category? How about this one? The no idea that we mask well category. And let's start with Elizabeth. I saw four primary care physicians, five psychologists and counselors, two psychiatrists, and had two misdiagnoses, and no one ever once mentioned ADHD. I am the one who figured it out and then sought a diagnosis with a specialist in ADHD because I didn't want to waste any more time. That person was validating could see my masking right away, understood that my body was quiet, but my brain was on fire, and helped me more than words can say. Christina offered that she was told, it's not ADHD because you were able to focus during neuropsych testing, and you didn't do well on the impulsivity part because you were anxious about doing well on the test, and you were fidgeting the whole time due to anxiety. Right. Simone was told, It's not ADHD because I have a job 
a husband and children, and I'm 55. Alejandra was told it's not ADHD because you're a single mother of two. They are clean and fed, meaning the kids, and go to school. It's not ADHD. Abilie was told, you are never late. You scored high on your exams. You can sit still. You remember where you kept your keys. You asked me about my dog. You just think it's cool to have ADHD. Hence, you want a diagnosis. A lack of ADHD training in psychiatry and medical programs leads to no diagnoses or misdiagnoses. Dr. William Dodson tells us that 93% of adult psychiatry residency programs do not mention ADHD once in four years of training. There are no questions about ADHD symptoms on the board certification examination for adult psychiatry. Often, ADHD isn't even on their radar. Many doctors don't consider the possibility that ADHD could even be present. In a study examining which interactions between patient and psychiatrist led to the consideration that ADHD is present, not a single psychiatrist made the diagnoses. When the board-certified psychiatrists were told that they were participating in a study about adult ADHD, 60% of them refused to accept that attention deficit was a potential coexisting condition. Why is it that even though the vast majority of psychiatry and medical programs don't cover ADHD, many providers feel confident in ruling out ADHD? I mean, if you don't have the information needed to diagnose ADHD, you also shouldn't be qualified to rule out ADHD. Many doctors were taught that people outgrow ADHD in adolescence because the disruptive hyperactivity that you see in an ADHD child is often no longer present by the time they get to their late teen years. But it doesn't go away. It just goes up to the mind, right? Your mind becomes hyperactive, evidenced by racing thoughts that lead to uncontrollable emotions. It also often leads to sleep disorders in adults. I think we talked about this, right, with ADHD, which, remember, is also not recognized as a symptom of ADHD. I mean, think about it. If your brain and your body are hyperactive during the day, why wouldn't they also be hyperactive at night? Many doctors also resist an ADHD diagnosis because ADHD is different from what they know, which we already know is often little or nothing. And it wounds their ego not to be the expert on it. Many don't believe that ADHD is real. And this is despite the fact that the National Institute of Health, the American Medical Association, the U.S. Surgeons General, the American Association of Psychiatry, all agree that ADHD is a neurobiological condition that is real. And so why would that be? Well, because we're sucked into this puritanical idea that motivation is related to character and morals and can't possibly be biological. And who gets blamed most for children's bad behavior? The parents, right? Let's be more specific. The mothers. So what else do we hear? What are the other reasons why it can't possibly be ADHD? Let me offer you the no idea what ADHD looks like, but willing to diagnose any woman with anxiety, depression, or bipolar disorder. Michelle tells us this. My son's doctor at the time didn't feel comfortable diagnosing him, so she set us up with an appointment with a psychiatrist. He did a day-long testing evaluation, and we filled out lots of surveys, and I had a one-on-one meeting with him explaining why I thought what my son was dealing with might be ADHD. He agreed, and he gave the diagnoses. When I realized why I understood my son's struggles so much and that this was because I have the same struggles, I set up an appointment for myself at the same office with the same psychiatrist. 
I did the day-long testing as well. And while the tests administered were ex- weren't exactly the same because my son was 17 at the time and I was tested as an adult, we did have a lot of overlap. Our scores were literally a couple points away from each other. But because I was able to focus on puzzles, which I love, while being in a small, quiet room with literally no distractions or interruptions, I was told that my problem was an ADHD. He told me that I must be feeling distracted and having a hard time focusing because I have three children with large age gaps, and that is just difficult to manage. He was, however, willing to diagnose me with anxiety and depression. He suggested I take CBD oil. Ursula offers this, and this one's disturbing. I was initially diagnosed with ADHD via a questionnaire, then told that I had to do neuropsych tests if I wanted medication. I was then forced onto anti-anxiety meds that I didn't want and hated so that my anxiety didn't skew the test results. I aced all the tests because they took place in a quiet room, one-on-one with the psychologist, and was then told I couldn't have ADHD because the tests are much more accurate than the questionnaire. When I pointed out that the test conditions made it much easier to focus and explained the challenges I had focusing at home with my kids, I was told that I can't observe you at home with your kids, so that doesn't interest me. And that there's no ADHD without school failure, and it's just your anxiety making you scatterbrained for good measure. Nadine offers this. In my late 30s, I was told, if you can go to the theater and watch a movie without getting up, you can't have ADHD, period. Oh my gosh, Nadine, that's the only place I can watch a movie at all and have clue one what is going on. (laughs) Nadine goes on to say that another professional in her 40s offered this. Did you have ADHD as a child? No. Then you can't have it now. However, here are some meds to treat bipolar mood swings and some others for anxiety. Insane, isn't it? Just because you were not diagnosed as a child does not mean you don't have ADHD today. I suspect, knowing you, Nadine, that if you thought back to your childhood and found some old report cards, you would discover ADHD symptoms all over the place. And I know you have been since diagnosed with ADHD, so I know I'm right. Psychiatrists are just more familiar with mood and anxiety disorders. They're often not taught about ADHD, so they're much more likely to jump to those diagnoses and treatments, which can make it that much more challenging to receive the correct diagnosis of ADHD. And who gets diagnosed more often with anxiety and mood disorders? You guessed it. Yep, women. Women are often misdiagnosed with mood disorders, anxiety, OCD, sleep disorders, By the time most adults get the correct diagnosis, they have seen 2.3 doctors and have been through 6.6 failed courses of antidepressant or mood-stabilizing medications. And that is most adults. Can you imagine what the statistics must look like for most women? And then, of course, there's the, it's not ADHD, it's trauma. Amber Sarno, one of our fabulous mods, offered this. Because you have childhood trauma, it can't be ADHD. Well, guess what? It can be ADHD, as Amber knows. It can also be trauma. It can also be ADHD and trauma, or ADHD and a myriad of other comorbidities. Many doctors also don't recognize compensatory strategies like hypervigilance, anxiety, overpreparation as being connected to a larger root cause, specifically ADHD. So they're treating mood and other disorders without first looking at the bigger picture, which would include ADHD. Treating these other things and not looking at ADHD can make our ADHD symptoms worse. Treating only the anxiety is removing a compensatory strategy. Often, you treat the ADHD and the anxiety and or the depression resolves. Sometimes it's comorbid, often it's not. But these things need to be considered. 
ADHD needs to be part of the big picture. There's also stigma around stimulant medication. You know, the best medications used to treat ADHD are Schedule II controlled substances. They are also the most strictly controlled medications available by prescription. Even though stimulants have very low abuse potential when correctly prescribed, and they should be put back in Schedule IV, the least restricted category, where they were until 1978, this is all about politics, right? Their current controlled substance status makes clinicians fearful to prescribe them. Taken as prescribed medication as I said, provides the most effective and immediate benefit of any treatment, right? And stimulant medication has been prescribed for 50 plus years. It is a myth that giving stimulant medication to someone with substance use disorders or a predisposition to addictions, because remember with ADHD, we have a five to 10 times higher likelihood of addiction because of something called the reward deficiency syndrome, is going to cause more addiction or start anyone down this path of addiction. Numerous studies show an inverse relationship between drug therapy for ADHD and drug abuse. People with ADHD who receive appropriate treatment in childhood, almost always with stimulants, were 50% less likely than their untreated peers to abuse drugs or alcohol in adolescence or young adulthood. Since 80% of addictions get started between the ages of 13 and 23, and since those of us with ADHD are far more prone to develop an addiction than the general population, and since taking stimulant medication reduces the risk of addiction later on, according to Drs. Hallowell and Dr. Rady, it makes a lot of sense to start a child on stimulant medication before the age of 13. Of course, you need that child's buy-off, right? For a number of reasons. If they don't want to take it, it likely won't work. They're not going to take it. In my experience, though, what I've seen, the only time someone doesn't want to take medication is when the medication doesn't work and instead brings a bevy of uncomfortable side effects. I mean, if the medication is doing wonders for you, if you feel really good, why wouldn't you take it? Around 60% of people with untreated ADHD have a history of substance abuse, but it's because they've been self-medicating, which makes doctors, of course, extra hesitant to prescribe stimulants when stimulants, you know, will likely work for them. On the other side, we have doctors and medical professionals who say, no, it's not ADHD because the meds don't work. So I give you Andrea. Andrea says that after using Adderall for three years and becoming acclimated to it, it stopped working so well. I saw a psychologist asking to try a different medication because I've only ever tried this one kind. And this psychologist told me, if ADHD meds aren't working, maybe that isn't the problem. When I mentioned the body's increasing tolerance, Andrea's psychologist said, no, that doesn't happen. Yes, it does ask any ADHD expert. She pulled out all the stops to discredit my ADHD diagnosis and fit me into the bipolar box. That and the borderline personality disorder box, right? The hysterical female. That's where they love to put us. Nancy heard this. My primary care doctor said it's not ADHD because stimulant meds are generally effective. I've tried four different ones. It's not ADHD despite the diagnosis from a psychologist and then confirmation from a psychiatric nurse practitioner. I just love primary care doctors who know nothing about ADHD, but, you know, are so willing to offer their guidance and advice. Don't you, Nancy? (laughs) So why is it especially important that we have this conversation now? Well, Many medical professionals claim that ADHD is overdiagnosed. Because of COVID, you hear a lot of medical professionals saying that everyone thinks they have ADHD now because of TikTok, right? But when an estimated 50 to 90% of girls and women with ADHD remain undiagnosed, which is millions of people, could it actually be that women are finally being given are finally finding the information they need to understand their brains and advocate for themselves? I mean, little was known about what ADHD looks like in women day to day prior to it being talked about on social media and podcasts like this one, right? There were a few women 
Women like Sherry Solden, Kathleen Nadeau, Ellen Lippman, Patricia Quinn, all doctors, right? But other than that, not much, and few, if any, studies. Masking and using compensatory strategies becomes more challenging over time, right? And it can suddenly become unmanageable with stressful life circumstances or when structure or coping mechanisms no longer work. So, for example, this pandemic, right, where many of our societal structures fell away. So it was no surprise that a lot of people started having problems coping. Also, as women get older, ADHD symptoms often rear their head. We now know that estrogen modulates dopamine and we produce less estrogen as we age. And so this is what's responsible for so many more later in life diagnoses. I know for me, I was just totally hyperactive before, but once perimenopause started to mess with my estrogen levels, the wheels fell off the cart. So it wasn't just the hyperactivity, it was also the inattention. If doctors aren't taught to recognize ADHD, then the only option is for us to educate them, which many doctors don't receive well, right? But being on the wrong medication, especially mood disorder medications, can have a significant impact on our health. So we don't have any choice. Being unmedicated when we need medication can also lead to self-medicating and addiction. But remember, medication is never enough. And frankly, that's all even a good doctor is typically able to provide. Medication should only be part of the treatment. The other part is learning how your ADHD brain works and building workarounds that work for you. To the medical community who's just aghast at the rise in ADHD diagnoses or requests for diagnoses since COVID, how about this? We'll stop diagnosing ourselves using social media like TikTok, Instagram, or podcasts when you start doing your job and learn what ADHD actually looks like in women. Because the truth of the matter is, we were going to you for help, and instead, we were getting misdiagnosed with anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, etc., and put on all kinds of medications that more often than not made everything much worse. Or, if we were lucky, we were just sent home with a little pat on the head and comments like, honey, it's all in your head, or this is just life, it's hard being a parent, you're too sensitive, or in my case... Feeling this way is normal as you get older. The bloom just goes off the rose because nothing is as exciting. And the best one of all that I heard, Tracy, it's an Asian thing. Your expectations are just too high. You can't expect to feel how you used to feel. So how about if you start diagnosing us appropriately so that no more women have to go undiagnosed or get misdiagnosed, or have to see multiple medical professionals before they're actually diagnosed. How about that? Deal? If your doctor doesn't seem open to considering ADHD as a possibility, find a new provider. Tell them to mark in your chart that they're refusing to give you a referral. Look, if a doctor isn't qualified to diagnose ADHD, again, they aren't qualified to deny a patient a referral to meet with someone who hopefully, is more qualified to make that call. And this can be a huge barrier, right? It shuts down the process of getting an evaluation at all before it even begins. Most doctors will change their tune when they realize that you're not going to just shamefully walk away from asking for a referral. Clearly, if you want it in your chart, you're planning on taking it a step further. And even if they still say no, at least there'll be a note in your chart that you've sought out an ADHD referral in the past. And when you get that ADHD diagnosis, make sure that your chart gets updated for all to see. So in the face of a possible misdiagnosis, make the distinctions between a mood disorder and ADHD mood swings. So mood disorders are untriggered by life events. They come out of the blue. They're separate from what is going on in a person's life. So when good things happen, it doesn't make a difference. They're still miserable. They're still depressed. They're still unhappy. 
They also have a slow onset over many weeks to months. And they last for weeks, months, sometimes years until they're treated. There are also distinctions between generalized anxiety disorder, where you're experiencing baseless apprehensive fears, and internalized hyperarousal from ADHD. In ADHD, this anxiety often looks like never being able to slow down or have a moment of peace, always feeling behind, always feeling like you're in a rush or like you're missing or forgetting something. You're always thinking about a million things at once. You have trouble sitting still during under-stimulating activities like watching a movie. You're feeling antsy. You're unable to shut off that hyperarousal when it's time to sleep. There's a difference between, for example, with OCD, which is all about meaningless rituals that just don't make sense. So if you don't turn off the lights three times, every time you come into a room, your mother is going to die, right? It That makes absolutely no sense versus needing structured routines to complete tasks. The structure that ADHDers need is helpful, practical, and it makes life more efficient. Even if the need for the structure becomes excessive, it's still tied to getting things done and reducing chaos. Pure OCD rituals, they serve no objective purpose whatsoever, and they impair someone's ability to lead a productive life. Remember also that ADHD is highly heritable. It's almost as heritable as height. So if a family member has ADHD, there's a very high chance that you also have ADHD. So if one of your kids has been diagnosed with ADHD, there's a good chance that you, your spouse, or both of you may also have ADHD. The best thing that you can do, in my opinion, however, is to really learn about ADHD. Educate yourself about around what ADHD looks like. And then when you meet with your doctor, show up prepared because you may very well have to educate them. In episode number 40 of this podcast, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, I give you information on how to do that, how to prepare to meet with your ADHD professionals. In that episode, I've also created a checklist based off of Dr. Russell Barkley's adult ADHD scale, and you can find that episode in the show notes. So before I leave, I want to share two more, it can't be ADHD stories from our Facebook group. So Kelly shared about five years ago, I was diagnosed with ADHD, prescribed meds by my PCP and sent to an ADHD specialist to check for any other issues. Intake with the specialist went great. I did all of the self-assessments. I spent three months making huge progress and finally feeling like less of a failure. Then they made me take a computer-based assessment, the one that you give to kids. It was not a challenge, obviously, being a 30-year-old woman. I met with the specialist afterward who said, after everything we told you and all of the assessments, I swore you had ADHD, but the computer-based tests say you don't. So... Literally, I was crying. I asked her what I was supposed to do now. She spent the next 10 minutes talking to me about mindfulness and meditation. Now, mindfulness and meditation, of course, works, but oi, that computer test, you said it was for kids, but I'm wondering if it might have been the precursor to the QB check. Regardless, any computerized test is supposed to be offered only in concert with other testing. It's not the only thing they should be evaluating you on. It's insane to me that you were diagnosed. You spent three months making huge progress, and then, oops, this one test says, no, no ADHD, so just go on your merry little way. Like, that makes no sense. So I just took the QB check with uh, Lori Peterson's company, E. E-diagnostic learning. I love her. She's been on our podcast a couple times now. She did my educational assessments recently. And I did better on the actual test, on the actual QB test, than the sample cases, I think because I was so hyper-focused. I mean, I'm going to tell you it was hell. It was beyond irritating. So what you have to do is you sit at your computer And just the setup to make sure your face is in the right frame, and that was already nerve-wracking. But then what happens is they show, for example, a red circle, and then a blue square, and then a blue circle, and then a red square. But every time they show two of the same in a row, so a red circle and then a red circle, you have to hit the space bar. This is just 
I felt like I was going to jump out of my skin. It was so boring, but at the same time, I was so hyper-focused on it and just trying to keep my body together. As I said, it was hell. The only thing that saved me was my hyperactivity score because my actual score on the test was, as I said, above their sample. So it was quite good. But my hyperactivity score was in the 99th percentile. And I suspect that if I was purely in attentive ADHD instead of combined type, my total symptom score would have been too low to qualify for an ADHD diagnosis. So the last story that I want to share comes from Patricia, and like she did, I title it Asshat. (laughs) So this is what Patricia said. This psychiatrist I saw briefly for a medication adjustment when my usual prescriber was on hiatus was just an all-around asshat. But what put me over the edge was, despite clear evidence, I've been like this my entire life, To hear, it's not ADHD. You're screwed up because of that TBI you had five years ago. Stop thinking of yourself as someone with major depression disorder and ADHD and start to think of yourself as a person who is forever disadvantaged and needs to be in a group for brain-damaged folks like yourself. I wanted to stick a fork in my eye or his, LOL. We agree, Patricia. We want to stick a fork in his eye too, or better yet, get his license revoked. Medical professionals like that are clearly unqualified and miserable and don't belong in a helping field. So that's what I have for you for today. Thank you so much to all of our amazing smart-ass women who volunteered their stories and agreed to be part of this episode. If you liked it, please don't forget to leave us a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. And your reviews really help in that regard. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you and the fact that you show up every week. Recording this podcast, it's one of my most favorite things that I do, so thank you. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyoutsuga.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuga, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.